Happy now to introduce Dr. Gail Sonnenschein, who is professor in the Department of Developmental Molecular and Chemical Biology at Sackler and Tufts University. And we're very happy that she's going to speak on, as you can see the topic, Adamate, a novel target for treatment of triple negative breast cancer. And also should mention she's co-leader with Dr. Urban of the Breast Cancer Working Group, which I think has been a fantastic translational working group model that's been meeting for how long? A couple of years. A couple of years now. All right, great, thanks, Gil. Thanks, Ed. Well, I wanna um, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, about our work. We're currently trying to um, target a novel uh, protein that we saw is expressed in triple negative breast cancer called Adamate. And so I'd like to tell you about a uh, little bit about how we discovered and validated Adamate and then what our new efforts are in developing a treatment towards uh, Adamate positive uh, triple negative breast cancers. And in the interest of uh, full disclosure, uh, one thing we found as we were going through this process is that it's not easy to get money for development of an antibody or, or an antibody-based therapy from the point of view of making the antibody. And to, to that end, we ended up setting up a company uh, which is able to get small business grant, which is able to get money for development. But the goal of this company and our goal of our lab is to bring Atomate-based therapy to the clinic. So um, I don't need to go through all of this. I just want to point out that about a half a million women, uh, mainly women, die of breast cancer worldwide each year, mainly from metastasis. And while there are receptors on some breast cancers, ER and uh, HER2, which are used for treatment, uh, triple negative breast cancers lack these targeted therapy options. And so they're often treated uh, with chemo and radiation. That fails to stop the metastasis ultimately and also have severe side effects. And although TMBC is about 15% of incidence, it's 25% of all deaths. So novel target new treatment therapies for both TMBC and metastatic disease are urgently needed. And our work has validated Atomate as a novel target for treatment of triple negative breast cancer. So this introduces Atomate to you. Um, Atom stands for a disintegrant and metalloproteinase domain protein. It's membrane anchored, uh, exists on the cell surface. It is non-essential under uh, physiological conditions. And so a knockout mouse has no phenotype either with respect to development of the mouse or its lifespan. And we came upon Atomate, we had some discussion at the uh, lunch about uh, uh, figuring out how um, higher throughput uh, techniques. And we came upon Atomate actually from a walk down, several walk downs from an NF kappa B rel B pathway which we had shown was promoting the aggressive phenotype, particularly of ER negative breast cancers. So we did several walk downs and come up with a couple of, a number of genes and ended up focusing on Atomate because of these uh, properties that made it more ideal for targeting. So we're gonna talk about two domains on Atomate. One is a metalloprotease domain. The other one is a disintegrant domain. And these sit outside the cell, and I'll show you data that uh, these are therefore available to an antibody-based targeting scheme. And Atomate itself is made as a precursor molecule, as are most metalloproteinases. So it has a prodomain that inactivates the Atomate. And once it dimerizes, it actually autocatalytically clips off that prodomain. And what you end up with is an active form and um, it's a little separated in here, but they're actually dimerized. There's another processing step whereby the metalloproteinase domain can be clipped off, leaving a remnant form. And I'm only pointing this out because you'll see this in some of the Western blots, but it allows us to distinguish whether the role of uh, the activity that we're seeing is due to the metalloproteinase or the DI domain. So it's functionally helpful to have that. So, as I mentioned, uh, we found this uh, downstream of NF-kappa-B-rel-B, and the work was initially started by Mathilde Romanoli, 
who, and then uh, finished by Nora Minova in the lab, and I'll show you the paper, the data first from the paper which validates it. So atomate in normal breast is levels, uh, atomate levels in normal breast is extremely low, but if you look at invasive breast carcinomas, the levels go what, quite high, and this is true in 14 or 15 independent studies. But more importantly, if you look at the overall survival of patients, those patients with high atomate have a poorer overall survival and actually disease-free survival than those with low atomate. So it is not good prognosis to have high atomate. So we have collaborators in France, uh, Sophie Barrier-Nion and Delphine Luzang, who did immunohistochemistry for us. And they looked at either the normal breast or triple negative breast cancers. And in the normal breast, they asked at 50 samples, all 50 were negative for atomate, which, cons which is consistent with the RNA data. And when they looked at triple negative breast cancers, they found that 34% were atomate high. And by high, I mean anywhere between 25 and 100% staining. So not atomate low, we don't count those. 35, 34% are atomate high. But more strikingly, when they looked at metastasis, and not just metastasis from triple negative, it's all metastasis. When they looked at the metastasis, half of them were high for atomate. And you can see this panel from the lymph node, but also from the brain. So our lab asked, what is atomate doing? And in the cell, we started with uh, cell models. So we used a very traditional strategy of knockdown. So we can reduce atomate using siRNAs. And when we do that, in the cell line we started with was MDA, MD231, which, as you can see, expresses quite a bit of atomate. Um, and it's a triple negative line. So uh, this saw line, when you knock it down, loses the ability for anchorage independent growth. It loses the ability to migrate. It loses the ability to invade and do invasive outgrowth through matrigen. Interestingly, growth on 2D plastic was not affected. And this was true in not only in the MBA 231 line, but in HS578T, some 149. So it was, and also if we did a stable knockdown in the 231 cell of Atom 8. So we asked whether, um, what are the effects of this knockdown um, in tumor formation driven by TMBC cells in an orthotopic model? And I think you'll see the results were not what we actually expected, but are even more striking than what we expected. So these are cells that have Atom 8. They have SH control, so they have a, they've been transfected and in, um, with an SH control versus the SH atom eight. And what you can see is they're growing for a while. They're very slow. It's palpable, small tumor. And then beginning on day 12, you can see this break. And all of a sudden, the tumors grow much more rapidly. And we had to stop the experiment because the tumors reached the maximum size for IACUC protocol. Um, and if you can see, um, the tumors are red. They're highly vascularized. They're very large. And when we looked for metastasis, we found that every, the brains of six of six animals had a TMDC metastasis to the brain. So all the animals were getting mets. In the case of the atomate knockdown, we were quite surprised to see that they weren't growing at all. Each day, Nora and Matilde would come in and say, still not growing, still not growing. And then at the end of it, it then never grew. So what the tumors look like, and you can see it right here, they're small, they're not vascularized, they're just barely palpable. And when you look for Mets, five of six mice had nothing and this one mouse had what is a relatively small met, and that's it in the brain. So we started out to say, well, what does atomate do in the cell? What is it causing this tremendous difference in both um, angiogenesis and dissemination? So those of you who follow, I'm sure most of the people in the audience know 
that the, following the initial tumor growth, when the tumor reach a palpable size, it undergoes hypoxic stress. And as a result of this hypoxic stress, what you can see is that Adam-8 can get induced. And this is done in cells and culture. But if you look at the mice and the tumors in the mice, this is staining for Adam-8. This is the control mouse where you see the angiogenesis. You can see Adam-8. And in the Adam-8 knockdown, it really was very effective. And no Adam-8 was induced. So what that says to us is that in the absence of Adam-8, tumors go into tumor dormancy. And that, or at least it looks like they're going into tumor dormancy, such that they can't grow at all. So what does Adam-8 do that is causing this ability to grow? So the first thing we looked at was angiogenesis. And we did a classical assay for angiogenesis. Uh, that is tube formation, so you can take um, human and uh, umbilical vein endothelial cells, and if they're um, grown in the presence of angiogenic factors, they can form tubes. And we took the supernatant from the control or the knockdown cells, and you can see the level of ability to make tubes, both looking at branch points and polygons, is much higher if you have the control versus the Adam-8 knockdown. And we went on then to look at what was being released by the Adam-8 treatment of these cells, or I should say the presence of Adam-8 on these cells. And it turned out we can show that VEGFA, angiogen, and PDGFAA, endothelian, and placental growth factor were all being secreted. And we can map that to the MP domain using some transfections of remnant versus full. So then what does Adam do, or how does Adam promote the metastasis that we saw? So we did a number of assays that are specific for metastasis. And the first thing that has to happen for a tumor cell to metastasize is the endothel that the tumor cell has to adhere to the endothelial cell. And then it has to go through the endothelial cell layer into the bloodstream. So that's the first step. And we can mimic that in assays in culture. The first one is asking, can the cells adhere? And the next one asks, can they get through the endothelial cell layer? Adam-8 positive, Adam-8 negative. Doesn't adhere very well. Trans and migration through the endothelial cell layer is grossly and gigantically impressed in the absence of Adam-8. And we could actually figure out why this was true. Because to bind, one needs to have uh, activation of a protein called beta-1 integrin. And that happens through Adam-8. And we can show on the Adam-8 negative cells there was no activation of beta-1 integrin. So we can map that to that phenomenon. And then in collaboration, with uh, Irene Georgiakudi's lab, Mike Palmer, who was a, a student in her lab, uh, Mike and uh, our group collaborated to see whether tumor cells could actually get into the circulation from the tumors. And what he can show from his analysis was that there was a big reduction of circulating tumor cells if you didn't have Adam-8. And that occurred very early, actually at day seven. And if you remember, day seven is actually before we really see that break in the curve. It is early event that the tumors cannot get through the blood into the bloodstream if you don't have Adam-8. More recently, we did a study with um, Ben Dake and uh, Charlotte's lab, where um, uh, Ben taught us how to do uh, cardiac injections. So we went and took cells that were the, either the control or the knockdown, and we introduced a luciferase vector. And we can show that if you take Adam-8 knockdown cells, you're seeing a profound difference, not just in the ability of them to metastasize and get out of the, of the site, but actually their ability to colonize as well is also dependent on Adam-8. So from all of those studies, we came out with this plan that Adam-8 plays dual roles, both in angiogenesis as well as adhesion and intravisation and extravisation that lead to metastasis. So 
our next goal was to figure out if we could target ME. And to do that, we considered two strategies. And the first strategy was, well, first we needed, we knew from other work and the work I presented that we had to inhibit both the MP and the DI domain. Inhibiting one was not going to be sufficient. A lot of groups have tried to, tried to inhibit the MP domain using a small molecule inhibitor that can go into the pocket of the MP domain. And they could get it to go in, but the problem is specificity. That if they have something that goes in, so many of the MP domains are so similar, they lose specificity. So they have failed, including trying atomate. So we decided that we were going to try a different approach using antibodies. And so we knew that in, in, in a monoclonal antibody, if it could recognize this region, could potentially inhibit both. And we were very lucky because, um, and this part of the reason why we picked the strategy, was there was a commercially available antibody that was made. And it was made to the outside domain of Atom8. And it bound to the MP and the DI domain. So we tested it and found that it actually could inhibit both the MP and the DI domain. So these are assays for MP and DI domain. This antibody, which I'll refer to as MAB1031, could inhibit both. So we did a mouse experiment. We took now the control cells, only the control cells, and we put them into the mice, and we started treatment with either an isotype-matched uh, control antibody. So this is just IgG2B. The antibody is an IgG2B, or a dose of this antibody, and we could see that we can inhibit both primary tumor growth, and we also got a reduction in brain meds. So we wanted to look um, more thoroughly at metastasis, so we designed a slightly different experiment, which is called neoadjuvant, and that means that you're going to give your chemo or your treatment before you do surgery. And this is currently being used frequently, so we introduced the tumor cells, we waited till the tumors were palpable, and then we said, okay, let's add some antibody, and then we removed the tumor, and that way we can now allow the antibody to tell us whether it can inhibit metastasis better than if we just kept the primary in there because we were going to reach our endpoint too quickly. And the results were dramatic. So here's brain and lung. This is the control, and now we've let it go out for five full weeks. And you can see eight of eight mice have brain mets, and now we see a lot more of them. Seven of eight mice had lung mets, but in the anti atom treated, only seven mice had nothing we could detect. Two had something like this compared to that. Eight of nine mice had nothing in the lung and had only one that had anything. So what it says is that the growth and dissemination of tumors derived from atom positive cells was clearly susceptible to antibody targeting. So this strongly supported the notion that we should further evaluate taking atomate therapy into the clinic. And it said that MP and DI domains were critical. This paper was published. Matilda and Nora were the first and second authors. And we had a lot of collaborators that helped us get through this process. So part two, can we take this into the clinic, is basically the question. And MAB 1031 is not translatable for various reasons. So the first part of this process was the submission of, uh, of a patent. So for those of you who haven't done, you need to protect your IP, or you will not get any ability to move this into the clinic. So the school submitted a patent with Nor uh, Nora, Matilda, and I. And its claims are for prognosis, diagnosis, and treatment of Adam 8 expressing cancers. And I can tell you we're talking about triple negative now, but it's actually on pancreatic, lung, renal, hepatocellular carcinoma. So if we make an antibody, it could have a huge impact in the clinic. And so we, we claim that our novelty was that we need to functionally inhibit both. So we proceeded to isolate our own anti atomate antibodies. And I'm not going to go through all the details of this, um, but just to tell you the summary slide is we have made 17 um, mouse monoclonals that selectively inhibit atomate, i.e., we have removed activities 
any antibody that has activity against anything similar to Atomate has been deleted from our pool. And they're specific. And when we look at the activity compared to the MAB 1031, we're seeing, for the most part, in one or both, equal or better activity. This is percent inhibition. So we took uh, four of these, and we tested them. And originally, we were going to do a much more a smaller test in vivo, but we were advised by pharma that testing the, the antibodies in vivo in mice was a critical. So we bit the bullet, so to speak. And we designed now uh, a different uh, type of experiment. It's called single dose in vivo efficacy screening. And in our case now, we're looking at pre-existing tumors, no longer co-treatment because that's the gold standard. So we can show that IgG, um, ADP2 and ADP13 can cause about a 50% drop at this one dose we picked of 10 mg per kg um, inhibition of the growth of the primary tumors. ADP3 and 19 were somewhat less effective. So we, we dropped those. And we're currently doing dose response curves on these with both the MDA231 as well as the, uh, another cell line, SOM149. We tested this in a neoadjuvant model in which we have now taken luciferase tag 231 cells. We, made, we had the tumors. They were treated for a couple of times, surgically removed the tumors, and then we went out an additional six weeks and looked to see from metastasis uh, using IVIS machine and biophotonic fluid with fluorescence, basically. And this is the, these are the data for the GI system. And you can see that the, these are control mice versus our antibody treated. And these three, if you sort of focus in 16 and 17, look like this in the scan. This one is our highest with the treated versus 19. And you can barely see anything. So what it says is that these antibodies are able to block uh, METs to the GI system. We have similar data for liver, pancreatis, pancreas, reproductive system, and bones. Um, and all, in all those organs, the antibody reduced metastasis. So the big question, the biggest question you can ask on an antibody-based therapy, and the actually the only important question to ask in some ways is, it, does it increase survival? This is the FDA standard for treatment. And so we did um, a survival experiment, and we were quite nervous initially. Um, when, the initial, when you start, start seeing the mice going down. So this is a survival neoadjuvant experiment that was performed, as I told you before, except mice were treated first to three times with 10 mix per kg. Then they got either IgG1, which is this is an IgG1 antibody, or ADP13 for 12 weeks after they were surgically resected. So recurrence, our assay for recurrence is having a palpable tumor. So if you palpate it on day, say, 18, and you see something, you then wait and make sure it's starting to grow and that you really didn't mix up. But you go back, and you, you, that, that palpable tumor is listed on day 18, the first day you see it. And then for survival, the endpoint was 0.9 centimeters cubed. At that point, we're very close to our endpoint permissible by the IACUC protocol. And if you look at this, it's actually, as I was preparing this talk, I realized how close these were to the, the data for the patient data that I showed you earlier, as far as high atomate and low atomate. It's about a 50% reduction, and that's what we're seeing here. So we're quite excited because this would indicate that atomate-based therapy would enhance survival for patients, or at least it's consistent with that. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why it might not be, but it's certainly consistent. We're now in the process of doing the same experiment with ADP2. So how do we get this into the clinic? So there is one really interesting uh, discovery that was made by Sonia Das in the lab. And that is that Atomate actually regulates the expression of a number of microRNAs. 
And these microRNA, 60 of them, when we started looking at what their roles were, many of them were involved in resistance to chemotherapy. So that was quite intriguing and led us to ask, so here's some of them, but actually there are data on more of them now. So it, it led us to ask, can Adamate be playing a role in the, um, in, uh, in protecting cancer cells from being killed by chemotherapy. So if you just look at this middle panel, adding antibody alone, so uh, this data is with Paxlitaxel and ADP13. And if you take the cells and treat them with antibody alone, you get a little bit of decrease, but not much. And then if you look at a very low dose of Paxlitaxel, you're not getting killing. But if you add ADP13, you enhance that killing. And if you do it with a slightly higher dose of paclitaxel, where you start seeing some killing, the addition of the antibody really dramatically, well, dramatically, 50% improvement in the killing is pretty good. So now we have our way of getting this, we feel have a way of getting this into the clinic. And that is that we can take patients who, um, fail their first line chemotherapy, which is usually with doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide. And we developed this strategy with a lot of input from Jack Urban, who informed us that we weren't going to be seeing naive patients because standard of care is so strict. So we would be looking at patients that have recurrent TMDC, and we can select for those that have um, Adam 8 positive cancers. And then we can ask if um, we can ask a patient whether she would prefer to have chemo alone or chemo plus our antibody. And then we're not depriving a patient of quality of care. So the patient could take Paxlitaxel uh, alone if she preferred. And we would predict that after a while there would be recurrent metastasis over a current period of time. Or she could take Paxlitaxel plus our antibody therapy. And given the fact that we find that we'll get enhanced killing of the primary tumor, even alone from the antibody, plus delayed recurrence, plus inhibition of metastasis, we would predict and hope that we will see increased patient survival. So that is our strategy, and we're testing it first, obviously, in MOX models. So this is the group that has done um, the work in the lab. Nora, Stefania, Sonia um, are actively looking at the um, mouse doing one preclinical mouse model after the other. I hardly see them, so it's nice to see a picture of them, at least. Um, uh, Sonia is also working with Ninon on more of the microRNA story. Matilda started the uh, work. Um, we've had a lot of collaborators. Jack has been wonderful, and everybody, many people know Anne Marsak Rothstein, who has helped us with design of some of the antibody work, and we thank our uh, supporters, and thank you. And if there are any questions. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. I was wondering if you saw the effect on the suicide. Yes. Uh, if uh, that alone would uh, okay. reduce the task So we haven't done it quite that way because, but we have looked in the mice. And it turns out that when we start seeing at least circulating tumor cells, it's way before you see any tumors actually growing. So in that case, we see actually a very substantial drop in circulating tumor cells at that point. And in the experiment where we injected uh, the cardiac injection experiment, there are equal numbers of cells going into the heart. So those... Um, those uh, circulating cells uh, had an equal opportunity to colonize. And without Adam-8, we saw much less colonization. So um, we haven't done exactly what you wanted, but I think it's 
probably suggests there would be a difference. I think that the question is whether, how late can we hit this and still see uh, inhibition of metastasis? <laughs> Yes, right. You, well, this is, well, we have removed the primary tumor, actually, in that case. So, um, yeah, that was with, yeah, in that experiment, the primary tumor was also removed. Otherwise, it would have been. Yeah, so we start the antibody treatment uh, before we do the surgery. So we give them three hits with the antibody first, kind of trying to mimic what a patient, if, if she were going to get, a pretreatment would be doing. And then we uh, add, then we do the surgery and then we continue the treatment. And we've taken it, um, that was 10 weeks, but actually it's gone out a little further. We just had to sack those mice. But the ADP2 experiment is actually being run now. Yeah. One more question. Well, we'll have to see, won't we? <laughs> Basically. On that positive note, thank you, Dr. Fleischer.